strength and peace. His throne established, it shall never be moved. The Lord Everyone, thanks for being with us online. Hey, if you're on YouTube, feel free to subscribe below, hit the like button, share out the stream to family and friends. Feel free to leave us a comment. Let us know where you're watching from or if we'd love to interact with you throughout the service. Hey, I'm just standing in our lily pad room as a part of our next gen uh, wing. Yeah, I was just impressed on my heart as I was thinking this morning here just about Kettleston Gospel Camp and all the kids that are going to be venturing out to camp throughout the summer as well. We have summer arts and sports camps. And we just have some really consistent testimonies year after year of God getting a hold of, of children at a really young age. And uh, many of them finding salvation and, and having radical encounters with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So would you pray with me um, just into that together, just as we, we enter into a time of worship, even online. Lord, I thank you for each one who's with us online. And I ask in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, you just come and presence yourself with them. And God, we just want to lift up uh, all the camp ministry that's going on throughout the province, in particular at Kettleston, as well as our summer camps that we're going to be hosting here at the church uh, come August. We just ask, Holy Spirit, would you just come and reveal Jesus to the kids? Would you just come and capture their hearts and make much of Christ? And we just pray for just miraculous stories of salvation, miraculous stories of healing and encounter. And we just say we love you. And we just bless you this morning, Jesus, in your name. Amen. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sin and all our shame you took the nails and took our place no one else could do
everybody. Just a couple announcements to keep you up to date this week. If this is your first time at Regina Apostolic Church, a special warm welcome to you. If you're with us online, check out www.reginaapp.com. Click the I'm new button for ways just to get connected into the life of RSC. If you're with us in person, take the connect card out in the chair in front of you. Fill that out. Take that to the reception desk. We'd love to give you a gift. Thanks again for being with us. Friends, if you're interested in sowing into the mission of Regina Apostolic Church, there's multiple ways you can give. Check out www.reginaapp.com slash give for all the electronic methods. If you're with us in person, there's an offering slot at reception. Thank you for sowing into all that God is doing here and just allowing us to continue creating more resources like this. We're truly grateful. Thank you. As well, hey friends, happening on July 17th, Sunday evening at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary, we're having hymn sing, coming out for just a wonderful time to worship Jesus. We've been praying as well for Kettleston Gospel Camp throughout the summer. This week we have junior teen camp and we're sending a bunch of LIT leaders out to the camp. So that's leaders in training. So would we, can I just encourage you, be in prayer for Kettleston, be in prayer for those who are going out to serve, that the Holy Spirit would just touch and minister into hearts and that many would find and worship Jesus out there. Friends, hey, we're excited to be hosting a Street Invaders team for the first week of August, and we're in need of people to provide meals for the team. So hey, if your gift is cooking, would you consider making a meal and dropping it off at the church? Or you can donate a gift card that we can use to purchase food for the team. So if you're willing to help out in this way, would you please contact our summer student, Elizabeth Becky? You can reach her at summerstudentatreginaapp.com or let Judy know at the reception desk. And friends, our final announcement, as many of you know, we're going to be welcoming back Danny and Alicia DeLong. Danny's preaching this Sunday, and they're going to join us on staff here in September at the church. For those who don't know Danny and Alicia, they've been serving as missionaries overseas for many years. They have two children, Taylor and Alex, who we love, and they're going to be house hunting in July and are in need of some household items to fill their new home as their current belongings are going to be left in Turkey. So Acts 2 talks about the fellowship of believers. At that time, and it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So we as RAC, as a community of believers, have a wonderful opportunity just to bless the DeLong family in a real practical way. If this is something that you'd like to help with, then we would love your support. There's a few, few ways that you can be involved. I want to share those with you. Many of you probably have gently used household items that are still in excellent condition that you no longer need. Maybe you've even been debating about posting them on Virage Sale or the Marketplace or even just donating. So this Sunday, July 10th, we're going to be having a drop-off before and after both services in the multi-purpose room. You are welcome to bring new items as well as gently used items to bless the DeLongs with. We do ask that you only give things that are still in great condition, okay? Nothing ripped or stained or overly worn out or broken. This is not a drop-off for all the boxes you've been waiting to donate, okay? If we end up having multiple repeat gifts, like five blenders, we're just going to donate those extra items to Goodwill, so just understand that. And of course, if, if you'd like to, to do cash or check or credit card gift, you can do that through the church, either online or in person. Just make the checkout to the church and tag it with the DeLongs. You will not receive a donation receipt for this gift as RAC is restricted by the CRA and is unable to offer donation receipts for these particular types of gifts, okay? So be aware of that. Donated money will, will be used to purchase any items that are still needed after the drop-off uh, this Sunday. Gift cards to Walmart, Canadian Tire, Home Depot, HomeSense are also welcome. Please contact Aaron Signorowski. You can reach her at 306-537-6844 as there's designated storage where you'll drop these items off. If you're looking for more info on particular household items, go grab one of these sheets, okay, from reception. Judy has them available. And thanks for blessing the DeLong family. I hope, friends, I hope this finds you well. You have a wonderful week. Hey, everyone. My name is Danny. It is a pleasure to spend a bit of time with you here. Uh, if we haven't met, I got good news for you. We're moving to Regina. We'll be here in September working at the Regina Apostolic Church so we can come, hang out, let's have a coffee. That'd be great. If we have met, we've known each other for a long time, sorry, we're going to be closer to each other. You're going to have to figure out how to deal with that, maybe pray about it. I don't know, but we'll, we'll get through it together. Uh, the first thing I'd love to say to you is thank you. For the last 20 plus years, 24 years, the Regina Apostolic Church, you 
have been partnering with us, supporting us financially and through prayer to do what we really believe God called us to do. The last seven years of that, we were with Beyond, uh, the sending wing of ACOP, living in Turkey. And honestly, God moved in such incredible ways, but the only reason that happened was because of you. Literally, financial partnership with us allowed us to be there, but even more than that, prayer partnership was what caused the Spirit of God to move in the hearts of Turkish people to see them come to faith. And that wasn't possible without you. So such a huge thank you. It's been 20 plus years. I think what actually happened for us to work at the church was Cal Martin looked at it and he said, man, 20 plus years we've been giving money to these guys. We might as well just hire them. And anyway, something like that. I don't know. You'll have to talk to him about it. Can we pray as we get started? I think that'd be good. Hey, Jesus. It is so cool that you're hanging out with us. I mean, you got lots of places to be, more important than this, but you choose to hang out with us. And I don't even understand that really, but I know you love us, and that's amazing. So please, come speak to us this morning through this. And yeah, we just want to say thank you for, for loving us. We love you too. Amen. What I thought, again, we are closing a chapter for us in Turkey, and we're moving to Regina. And I thought it would be great if we just took some time and told you some of what God did this morning. So it's a bit more story heavy than normal, which if you know me, maybe it's not more than normal. It is kind of what I do anyway. Uh, Not a lot of Bible, but yeah, that'll be okay. You know, I'm a missionary. So missionary stories, what missionaries do. So we're going to take some time this morning and just tell you a little bit of what God did. And and then I hope we can wrap that up into a little Bible point at the end. Is that okay? Can we go with that? Uh, The title of this sermon this morning is called The Masterpiece. And so I thought it'd be great if we just you know, did a little painting this morning together and, and tried to create a masterpiece of what this is together. Uh, if I can tie my smock, it'll be good. Hold on, it's coming. There we go. I got some paints. I'll paint a picture for you this morning. Again, uh, I thought it'd be good to tell stories, but again, maybe some of you don't know me very well. So just as way of introduction, uh, who is Danny DeLong? Well, I have this like sort of insatiable need to be known as a good communicator. It's not healthy, uh, but it's true about me. I want people to think I'm very funny. Uh, I want people to think I'm creative, but along with that, pull it out of that, I want people to think, not only is that guy funny and creative, but wow, God moves through him and he touches people's hearts. And, and because of that, I have this sort of way that I will manipulate people and feelings uh, through humor most of the time, and it's a lot of exaggeration. People call it lying, uh, and I guess it's lying, uh, but hopefully I would do that in a way that would be so over the top that you would know I was exaggerating, but I don't always. Sometimes it's just manipulation. Uh, And I tell you that because I think it's important. Again, we're telling stories this morning that you would know kind of who I am. and, And that's true. And it's a terrible thing about me, and I try to control it, but it's just an insecurity that I have. And we all live with insecurities. Uh, I would say another thing about me, I'm a I'm a I'm a guy who, you know, when the going gets tough, I do really well. You know what I mean? When all things are going crazy, haywire around me, I'm like calm and I, I'm level-headed and I actually make pretty good decisions under pressure. Uh, and so along with that part of my personality, I would say over the last several years of this pandemic, I have struggled with my mental health. And that actually shocks me as, again, this person who I think is quite level-headed and just easygoing really is a better way to put it. But man, if I'm honest with you, it's been a rough couple years for my mental health. I've had thoughts that I never thought I would have, uh, and, and I'm surprised about that. Maybe some of you are looking at me and going, I'm not surprised about that. I knew that about you a long time ago. But, but if I'm honest with you, it's been surprising. Uh, another thing for those of you who don't know me, I'm fully uneducated. I, I, I mean, I graduated high school, but I've never gone to Bible college. I never went to university of any kind. I took a few courses online, but I mean, what's that? I guess everyone's doing that now, but back when I did it, no one did it. And along with my lack of education, I'm super opinionated. Uh, Just the best kind, right? Have no training or knowledge, but have an opinion about everything. That's a little bit who I am. Uh, Along with that side of it is, I would say, I love that I'm not educated. I wear it sort of as a badge of honor, like I'm outside the system of education, so my opinion's better. In case you haven't noticed, another thing I struggle with is pride. 
which you might think is crazy. This guy who doesn't have education, who struggled with his mental health for the last number of years, would still struggle with pride. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense, uh, but it is who I am. Uh, last thing I would say to you is I, I struggle to hear the voice of the Lord. Does anyone else struggle with that? What you'll probably hear me say this morning, because I say it lots of times when I preach, God told me this, or God said that. And that's just Christianese way of saying, I hope and I think that I heard from God, but I don't really know. And again, it's a bit of a manipulation thing. It's, it's a bit of way of me saying that, uh, you know, I'm more spiritual than I really am. And I do it a lot. I don't want to do it because it's become so normal in my life, like this sort of Christianese way of talking. It just sort of comes out. You guys like this? This is who's talking. If you're still watching this morning, I think we're going to have a good time. Uh, so here, let's start with the Bible verse. Uh, if you're with us, it's James chapter 5 and verse 17. It says this, Elijah was a human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Elijah was a human as we are. And I think we read that and we look at it and we think, yeah, Elijah had skin. Elijah, had, he bled when he cut his hand. He, you know, he walked. I walk, <laughs> you know. Yeah, he was like us. But th that's not what this is saying. It's saying Elijah, just like Danny, struggled with hearing the voice of God. And you might think that's crazy. He heard God's voice in incredible ways. And yet there's a portion of scripture where he was trying to figure it out, a lot like me. And I'll, you might think, well, Elijah, you know, he's, he's not like me. You don't know me. I mean, I'm a mess. I actually think what this is saying is Elijah was a human just like us. In all those ways, he was a mess. He's a mess like you are. And yet when he prayed that it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain. Like God heard his prayers. Now that's the backdrop, and uh, let's get into some stories. I think that's the best way to go. So we moved to Turkey, and our goals were this. It's just a simple goal, to see Turkey saved. There's 80 million people. That was our goal, 80 million people. And so with that, we thought, how could we do this? Like, what could happen that would make it possible to see the country of Turkey saved? And we thought we could plant a church, uh, and maybe in seven years, we could see 50, 60 people come to faith and, and come to our church. And actually, that would be incredible. It would be one of the largest churches in Turkey if that ever happened. There, there's 80 million people and around 4,000 Jesus believers in the whole country. And so, again, if, if say, maybe 100 came to faith through what we did, that'd be exciting. And yet, it wouldn't keep up with the population growth of this country. And so there would actually be negative church growth even within that. Maybe that got a little technical. The point is, we thought, if Turkey's going to be saved, just planting a church of 50 people is not going to do it. We need something else. We need multiplication. So what we wanted to do was see people come to faith and immediately place a DNA within them that they would want to lead others to faith. They would disciple others. We would disciple people in a way that would allow them to lead their friends and family to Christ, which would then allow those friends and families a DNA of leading their friends and family to Christ. The goal wasn't one church. It was multiplicative churches. That's what, we, that's what our goal was. And so we had a website. Our website... Uh, gave out free New Testaments. Sorry, I need another color of paint. Uh, free New Testaments. And uh, you, could, you could sign on, you could come and search for New Testament, and, and you could order a free one. And there was this guy named Özgür. He ordered one from us. He lived in a city about the same size as Regina, and zero churches in the whole city, none. As far as we knew at that point, there were no believers. I actually found a secret believer a, a few years later. But at that point, there's no believers in the whole city. And Osgur orders a Bible from us. Just in terms of context, last year we gave out 24,000 New Testaments. But you're thinking, wow, that's incredible. And on one level, it is incredible. Like, that's a lot of New Testaments, definitely. But what I would say is, if we gave out 24,000 New Testaments every single year, it would take over 3,000 years for that 80 million people to get a New Testament. And I'll tell you, in 3,000 years, most of those 80 million people are going to be dead. No, probably all of them, right? Uh, so it's nowhere near enough. That's why the idea of multiplication needed to be at the forefront of what we were doing. 
Anyway, those girls orders the Bible from us. We sent him a text message that says, hey, heard you ordered a Bible from us. Wondering if you'd like to meet. We could teach you how to read it. We could show you how to read the Bible. And his reply back was, I would love that. Please come to my city. And so we drive up to his city. It's a couple weeks later. We get there and uh, we meet with Osgur. We're sitting down in Starbucks and we say, hey, did you start reading the Bible? And he's like, yeah, I finished it. We're like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it a couple weeks ago. That's lots of time to read the New Testament. And we're like, uh, yeah, that's lots of time, yeah. So do you have any questions? And he said this, well, it didn't work. I go, what do you mean it didn't work? He said, well, I read the whole thing, but like I'm still the same. Nothing changed in my life. And this is a mark that I think as Christians we believe, but it's not actually true about the Bible, but it is what Muslims believe. Muslims believe that the Quran is a holy scripture from God. Now, we believe that about the Bible, of course, but what they believe is the words themselves have some sort of power, and just reading the words is enough to change your life, because the words are God's words. Now, you might think, yeah, that's what I believe about the Bible, but it's not actually true about the Bible. What is true is the Bible is a light that shines on a path to God. Now, that doesn't mean you get to God because you have to walk up the path. So the Bible is a book about a lifestyle, and you need to apply what the Bible says to your life to get to God. Does that make sense? It's not magic words that you just read. And sometimes we say that, like, if just read the Bible, you'll get through it. And you could read the Bible back to front, and nothing would change in your life. Now, there are times where you read a verse, and it's just like God speaking to you, and your life changes. Of course, brilliant. Not really what I'm talking about, though. There's times, and you've probably done it, I'm really low. I should read the Bible. And you do, and you feel worse at the end. It's, it's not a magic words book. It's a book that's a lamp to a path to God. And you apply it to your life, and your life changes. So we say this to Osgur. You know, it's not the same as the Quran. It's a different type of book. The style's different. You, you need to actually apply it to your life. And he said, well, how do I do that? And so we said, well, why don't we do a Bible study together right here in Starbucks, and we'll show you how we do that. And we have an app, and so he downloads the app on his phone that kind of teaches you how to do that. And we do a Bible study. And in the Bible study, we ask four questions. Question one, what does this portion of Scripture teach me about God? Question two, what does this portion of Scripture teach me about man or humanity? Question three, really important question, what do I have to do to obey this portion of Scripture? And we write the answer down. And we say, you have to, if you want to follow the Bible, if you want to see what this book has to offer, you have to do what you think is obedience to this Scripture. And the fourth question is, who do I have to share this with this week? Another important question that lots of Christians don't like to do. Uh, but the reason that's important is twofold. One, the Bible commands you to share with your friends and family, so that's why it's important. But the second reason is to actually learn something. You know, you just hear words. You're not going to learn much this morning, let's be honest. You're not going to remember much of this talk this morning. Tomorrow you'll forget everything you heard here this morning. But if you had to teach what I taught you this morning, you're really trying to think it through. Well, how would I share this with my friend? What do I have to... And so to tell someone else about what you're learning really sinks it into your heart as well. So that's why that step's important. Anyway, we show him all that. We tell him all that. And he's like, okay, I think I'm going to try this. We're like, great. We said, well, we'll check in in a couple weeks. We're going back home. We lived a few hours away in a different city. And we'll come back in a few weeks. We'll see how it's going. He said, perfect. We do this all the time with people. Okay, so lots of times people say, oh, I love this and never do anything. But we came back a couple weeks later. And we said, hey, Oscar, do you want to get together for a coffee again? He said, oh, I would love to. And we're like, oh, perfect. And we sit down and we said, how has it been going? He said, did you bring more Bibles? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I started applying this to my life, and I started, it's changed me. And so then I thought, I need to share this with all my friends, and my friends all want Bibles. And we're like, uh, we didn't. And so the next week, we bring him 10 Bibles. And he's like, why 10? He said, this is nowhere near enough Bibles. The next week, we bring him 10 more. He's like, not enough. We bring him, over the course of three weeks, we take him 30 New Testaments. He lives in a dormitory, university dormitory, and he is literally reading with all his friends in the dorm. They get together in the evening instead of going out like university students would. They're just in there reading the Bible and trying to apply it to their lives. And again, we build in him this idea that if you want to follow Christ, you have to replicate yourself in other people. That's what Jesus' followers do. And so he gets that really quick, and he's like, I want to see... Within a couple of weeks, he says yes to Jesus. We baptize him. But he says, I want to see my friends baptized, which is so exciting. This was our whole goal. 
Sadly, all those university friends, all 30 of them, say no. They read together that they don't want it. They say no. They say, we don't want this Jesus that you're talking about. Osgur's disappointed, but we're like, keep going. That's okay. Lots of people say no. Find someone else. You can hang out with your friends. or still your friends, of course. You don't walk away from them. But just keep sharing with different people. You'll find people. And he's like, okay, cool. And eventually, he actually leaves university for the summer and goes back to his hometown. And he has a, a friend that he's you know, been friends with since child. And he says to him, hey, I've been reading the Bible. Would you like to read it with me? His friend says, yes. And his friend starts to read. And his friend is like, I want Jesus in my life. And then Osgur's text says, he's like, my friend's become a Christian. And we are over the moon. This is literally the first step of what we wanted to see happen. It's the first time this happened to us in Turkey where a disciple of, that we saw come to faith leads one of their friends to faith. The beginning steps of multiplication feel like addition. Do you know what I mean? It's one guy. It's like one guy who led one guy. This is a monumental step in multiplication. We were partying. We were so excited that this has happened. A couple, couple weeks later, he says, my friend wants to be baptized. And we say, you're going to baptize him. He said, please come out. We said, we baptized you. We showed you how to do it. The Bible clearly says that you will baptize. And we read the portion of scripture with him. He's like, you're right. You're right. I'll baptize my friend. Again, I don't know if you're as excited about this as I was at the time. This was the first time this had happened for us in Turkey. And we were just like literally overjoyed. Like this was Everything that we were dreaming about at the start of our time in Turkey was to see this very thing happen. That's story one. Can we tell more stories? All right, let's, story two. Uh, I had this friend, again, he had ordered a Bible through us. His name was Ferdi. He lived in a small town in the middle of nowhere. Ferdi had actually ordered a Bible 11 years before I sent him a message. No one had contacted him in 11 years. We had lists of thousands and thousands of names of people who had ordered Bibles but never heard anything from anyone. And so I send him a message. It's a weird message. Hey, remember 11 years ago when you ordered the Bible? Uh, did you get it? That would be a weird message. Can you imagine ordering something off Amazon today and 11 years in the future someone from Amazon says, hey, did you ever get that thing? So most people I message that to, they're like, who are you? I don't remember this. This isn't my number. You know, lots of things happen in 11 years. This guy, I messaged, I said, hey, did you get that Bible? He says, I'm reading it with my neighbor right now. Can you send me another one? My neighbor wants it. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. And I said, listen, I can send you another one, but I could also just drive out to your town and I could give it to you. He said, you'd come here? I said, yeah, of course I'd come here. Like, why wouldn't I? He said, please come to my town. So the next week, we drive a couple hours away from the city we lived in. We get to this guy's town. It's a village. And we're sitting in the middle of the town drinking a cup of tea in this like little square in the middle of his town. And I said, what happened? You know, you got this Bible 11 years ago. Tell me what happened. He said, well, I found your website. I ordered the Bible and I just read it and and it was true. I knew it was true. And I said to my family, you guys, you guys need to read this. And my family, I started doing Bible studies with my family and, and my friends and my neighbors. Like I said, my neighbor wants one now. And this guy had just started this little movement to Christ without ever meeting a Christian. He'd emailed some churches to say, come visit me. And they sadly said they didn't have time or it was too far or whatever. And so they never went and visited him. And, but he didn't care. He was like, Jesus is amazing. I want to tell everyone about Jesus. And I said to him, have you ever read anything about baptism in the, script, in, in the Bible? He's like, yeah, of course. I said, what do you think about that? Would you like to be baptized? And in this tea shop, we've known each other for an hour, this guy, Faraday, he starts to cry. He's like, all I've ever wanted was to be baptized. He said, so many times I've literally sat in my bathtub thinking, could I just baptize myself? Because I've never met anyone who could baptize me before. He said, can you baptize me? I said, bro, it'd be my absolute pleasure to baptize you. And then we started talking about other stuff. He starts talking about how he needed more education. You know, like if he could just learn the scriptures better, he could actually see his town come to faith. And I said, well, how many times have you read the New Testament? He's like, many. And you, he pulled out his New Testament. It's a worn book. Like he's read it through. And he did need more education in that he actually never even knew there was an Old Testament. No, he'd never read it. When I said, have you read the other parts? He's like, what? There's more to this? He was so excited. Uh, but we also said this, you know, I think you've been reading this for 11 years. The disciples, after Jesus, Jesus was only with them for three years. And he left. You've been a Christian longer than they had at that point. I think you have the education you need. He said, well, what do you mean? 
And we started reading verses that says, like, the, the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in you. And he's like, is that true? The Holy Spirit lives in me? And we're like, yeah, of course it's true. He's like, so I could just go around in the power of the Holy Spirit? And we're like, absolutely. The next week we drive, we, we left, of course. We drive back to his town the next week to go visit him again. We're like, how's it going, man? He's like, something incredible happened this week. We're like, well, tell us. He's like, well, I was talking to my friend on FaceTime. We were FaceTiming. And my friend, I was telling him about Jesus, and my friend started manifesting a demon. And we're like, what? What? And he's like, and then in that moment, I remembered that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. So I was like, Jesus cast demons out of people, and his disciples cast demons out of people, and I'm one of Jesus' disciples. You guys told me that. So I could cast demons out of people. And we're like, yeah, okay. And so he's like, on FaceTime, I just looked at him, and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, out. And the demon left, and I don't believe my friend Faraday. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a fun story, but that's obviously not true. He pulls out his phone. He had recorded the conversation, and it's literally what happened. This guy, with one moment of empowering, sees the Holy Spirit use him, literally starting to transform his entire village for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you one more story. This is my favorite one. So if, you've, if you're checking out, check back in. This is the best story we got. Hold on, I need more paint. Purple seems like the color I'm not using enough. So we go to this town. It's called Fetier, okay? It's a gorgeous little town. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea, zero Christians, just beautiful. And there's this guy there, his name's Emra. Emra had ordered the Bible three years previous. And when he got the Bible, again, just like Faraday, he read it, and he's like, Jesus is the answer to all the things in my life. And he starts to live out a Christian life. And because he did that, he lost his job, he lost his family, he lost his friends, and he ends up living on the streets for six months. And he says to me, when we meet him for coffee, he says, in that moment where I was on the streets, I had nothing but the clothes I was wearing, and he said, I have my New Testament. And he said, Jesus was enough for me. I'm like, who are you, man? Who are you? And so then we start talking again. We talk to him about baptism. He's like, please baptize me. Three years he'd been a believer and he'd never met another Christian. And we're like, we'd love to baptize you. And he's, of course, he lives in this smallish town, a little bit bigger than Regina, but in Turkey it's small. And word spreads really quickly. So everyone knew that he wasn't, uh, that he was a Christian and that he'd made these steps. So it was hard for him to find a job. So he's kind of getting day labor work and, and that was it. He couldn't find any other work. And so at the end of our couple hours together, we said to him, is there anything, any prayer requests you have? And I was sure it was going to be for money. And I'm thinking, should we give this guy money? Like what kind of thing? And he said, the only prayer request I have is that there would be a church in my city. And we looked at Emra and we said, you know, Emra, the only way that's going to happen is if you keep telling your friends and family about Jesus Christ. And he said, listen, I tried that. Three years ago I did that and I ended up living on the streets. Like it cost me everything. And we're like, I know. But I think you might have to try again. And I don't want to tell him that because that seems really hard. And he's like, I don't know if I can. And I'm, in my heart, I'm like, good, I don't think you should either. But he's like, but I want to. And I'm like, oh man, how are we going to make this happen? And I said this, maybe what we could do right now is pray and ask God to show you someone that he's already working in, one of your friends. And then when you tell that friend about Jesus, he'll be receptive to the idea. And he's like, oh, that's cool. And so we start to pray. And immediately he's like, I got it. I got my friend. He's like, he's a professor in town, university professor. And if, I think he'd be open to Jesus. And we're like, okay, great. And he said, listen, can you give me another New Testament and I'll give it to him as a gift. And if I give him a gift, he'd probably say he wants to read with me because, you know, is a gift. And we said, wonderful idea. So we give him the New Testament and we leave. And we're driving home a couple hours away again and literally the whole way praying, God, don't let this be wrong. Don't let it be bad. Don't let this guy lose everything he has again. Please be with him. Please work. And just in absolute fear for our new friend. A couple days later, he calls us up. He said, you'll never guess what happened. We're like, what? I have no idea. And he said, well, I was too scared to share. And we're like, good. I was too scared for you. And he's like, listen. He's like, this morning that guy called me up, the professor. And he said to me, he said, Ferdy? No, Amra, confusing the names. He said, Amra, do you have a book about how to follow Jesus? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, last night I had a dream that you and Jesus were sitting under a tree. And Jesus said to me, Emra has a book about how to follow me. Get it and follow me. 
And Amber's like, yeah, I got it two days ago. And he said, we're sitting in a coffee shop right now. A church has started in our city. We're reading about Jesus. We're following Jesus. Pretty cool. Can I read this scripture to you again? James chapter 5, verse 17 says, Elijah was a human as we are. And yet he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall and none fell for three and a half years. All these guys, us, they're just like Elijah. Just like him. And what I want to encourage you with is you have that same power. But some of you are thinking right now, some of you are excited about this. Okay, I'm going to go out. I'm going to share. I, I'm excited. God moves. He can move here. And some of you just hearing this are discouraged. Because you know your life's a mess. And you don't believe that Elijah is the same as me or is the same as you. You look at your life, you're like, no way. And these other guys, I mean, they took steps of faith. Elijah's not like you. What I would say this is, I've curated all these stories for you. They're only half true. You see, the first story, the first story about Osger, right after he texted us, I just baptized my friend, the next text said this, does it still count if I baptized him when we were drunk? I've never had that as a discipleship problem before. I didn't even know how to answer that. I mean, try to go to scripture for that. I don't know. What do you mean? He's like, we were too scared, so we just got drunk and decided to do it. Problem. It's a bit of a mess. That second guy, Faraday, in that small town who had literally cast out demons and seen like his neighbors coming to Christ, I haven't talked to that guy in a year and a half. He met a woman, moved to another city, and is now living with her. I mean, I've texted, I've tried, but I don't know what's happening. The university professor guy, the guy's having the dreams. I'll tell you what, in that city, way more people started having dreams. About a year ago, they stopped talking to us. I actually believe that it's the start of a movement that will see Turkey saved, but I don't know. I, I don't even know what's happened with them. I'm not even sure why. We've tried so many times to get in touch with them, but these stories are a total mess. They're your life. Can I read you one more scripture? This is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. For you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. You read that scripture and you're like, well, that's not true about me. I'm a mess. I'll tell you this stuff about my friends. They're a mess. My life, it's a mess. And I started thinking about this scripture. You know what a good masterpiece is? It's not something that's neat and clean. You read a novel. If a novel's just got no conflict, it's just you have this wonderful character who's perfect, and throughout the book, everything just works out. That's not a masterpiece. It's a child's book. What's a masterpiece is this person has great tragedy or conflict or, or personal failure, and they work through it, and then something out of the end is created, and it's beautiful. You watch a movie. If, you, if nothing bad happened in that movie. It's not a good movie. A masterpiece is one where someone comes out of the fire and they're changed and they're new and they're created different. So your life being a mess, that's the masterpiece. So God takes the weak things of the world, us, the mess, and turns them into a masterpiece. That doesn't mean that going ahead, you're not still a mess. It does mean that you are beautiful. My kids, they would paint when they're six years old. It's terrible. And you know what I did? I hung it on my fridge because I was proud of it. Because to me, it was a masterpiece. You, you're a mess. And Elijah was just like you. A mess. And God looked at Elijah and he said, you're my masterpiece. God looks at you and he says, you're my masterpiece. Can I show you the masterpiece I created this morning? It's a masterpiece. I mean, if you could turn that into something good, you're an incredible artist. God would look at this and he'd say, I'll take this, let's be honest, it's terrible, and I'll turn it into something amazing. God wants to take your mess and make it amazing. Can we pray this morning just to wrap this up? Father, we're a mess. I mean, you know it. You know everything about us. It is so hard for me to believe that Elijah's like me. And yet you said that he was. And you used him in, I mean, he raised people from the dead. 
I pray that you would take our messes and turn them into masterpieces. I pray that you would take all this jumbled up junk that we've taken and turned our life into and turn it into what good you have. Use us. I thank you that you're proud of us, that you're hanging our mess up on your fridge and you're saying, I can use this. I can make it a masterpiece. We love you, Lord. Amen. Your decrees, they trust worthy. Your decrees.